So we're moving on to module three today. Uh, we finished with um, introducing you guys to the cloud and sort of preparing um, your data and your annotations and your reference alignments and doing your alignments. So now, of course, the next thing is to try to estimate um, actual expression levels uh, for the transcripts and genes um, based on those alignments. And we're going to continue to work our way through this working example of the RNA-seq analysis pipeline. Um, and specifically in this module, we're going to cover um, the concept of estimating expression from, um, as I said, those alignments for genes and transcripts. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, this concept of FPKM, which you may have heard of, um, and the use of that versus raw count-based approaches. Uh, we'll talk about some of the different differential expression methods and then a little bit about um, downstream interpretation of expression and differential expression um, with some um, kind of gotcha topics. So you guys have already looked at some of your data in IGV. Um, you should have anyway. And hopefully you saw something like this. You saw alignments, um, very clearly spliced alignments where you're seeing most of the reads align um, obviously to the exons of a gene with some alignments spanning um, exon to exon across um, those splice junctions. And we started talking yesterday about just in a very general way how you could start to think about expression and differential expression based on that data. Really the amount of alignments are some kind of measure of expression, right? So. There's a certain amount of noise um, with the possibility of misalignments and um, biological noise in terms of just transcriptional noise. Uh, but in general, if you see a pattern like what is, is depicted on the screen, you can already feel fairly confident that this gene is expressed, right? I mean, this is very convincing evidence of um, fragments that are clearly spliced RNA. Um, it would be a, crazy coincidence to see alignments like that if you just had some genomic DNA in your sample. Um, there's definitely some RNA from these transcripts there. So you can already say there's probably expression of this gene. Now the, obviously the more interesting question is how highly expressed is it um, compared to other time points, compared to other samples, um, in comparison between different conditions and so on. And you can also get a general feeling for that simply from looking at the alignments. Uh, with some caveats. So uh, you'll recall that from this view along the top, if I can get a mouse somehow, oh, this thing is not quite good. There's this thin bar along the top, right, which is the coverage track that kind of shows a uh, histogram, if you will, of the total depth of coverage at any position. And that kind of gives you a high level summary of the total amount of alignments at any given region and over this locus in general. And if your two libraries were sequenced to similar depth and you're looking at one gene between two samples and you see a massive pile of data in one sample and practically no data in, in the other sample, uh, very little alignments, you might already conclude that maybe there's evidence of differential expression, right? You can get a, a crude sense that this thing is more highly expressed um, than the other thing. And that, that is indeed the case here. Clearly there's a lot more um, reads on the top than the bottom, although visually that's hard to tell because you know you have this sliding window. If we were to slide down on the bottom panel, you'd see that the reads fall away quite quickly, whereas the top you could slide down and down and down and you'd just see more and more reads, um, which is um, depicted by the higher coverage bars. Something else you can see in this view is evidence of some three prime bias. So that's something you also want to think about and watch for, especially when it comes to um, data targets that require good coverage of the transcript. So if, for example, you're looking for variants um, or splicing patterns and you have much better coverage um, for some part of the gene than others, right? So this coverage kind of it tails away to almost nothing as you get um, towards the five prime end. So you'd have less power to detect events at this end of the transcript than at this event. 
Uh, this is something you really commonly saw with uh, poly A selected um, libraries, which I, I would guess that this probably was. Uh, you have a certain amount of RNA degradation, and then you're capturing based on one end, so it's inevitable that you sort of enrich for the end that you're capturing based on. Um, so this is a, another advantage, perhaps, of um, non-poly A approaches to RNA-seq. So what is FPKM or RPKM? Um, you've probably heard these terms. They're probably the most commonly used um, metric for expression levels based on RNA-seq data. Uh, I believe this goes back to the very first RNA-seq paper where they had a concept of RPKM. Um, and they may at that time have even coined the phrase. Uh, RPKM stands for reads per kilobase of transcript per million mapped reads. And really it's just a simple normalization to account for the fact that we can't simply count up the number of alignment, uh, the number of aligned reads for a particular transcript and use that as a comparison to other transcripts or other samples because there are some um, basic normalizations that have to be performed. Uh, and these have to do with the size of the gene. So larger genes, um, larger transcripts will just overall tend to produce more fragments and therefore have uh, more read sequence, even if there's the same number of copies of that transcript as some other shorter transcript. Again, with the library depth, if you sequence one sample to 10 times greater depth and you don't account for that, all of the transcripts and genes in that sample will appear to be more highly covered and therefore possibly more highly expressed than in your less well sequenced library. Right? So you can't just compare um, raw counts without kind of thinking about those issues. And so the RPKM is a simple way to account for that. FPKM is basically exactly the same concept uh, we just switched to using the fragments per kilobase technology or terminology when uh, paired end sequencing became popular and common. So with paired end sequencing, you actually don't want to count the two reads of the pair twice. Um, they're two reads sequencing the same fragment representing the same piece of a transcript. So in terms of counting, if your goal is to count up copies of transcripts in a cell or in a pool of cells that you've sequenced, um, you basically want to treat both those reads as evidence towards one fragment, which is evidence towards one piece or one um, copy of that transcript. So as I said in RNA-seq, the relative expression of a transcript is proportional um, to the number of cDNA fragments that originate from it, but you want to normalize um, for um, the size of genes and the total depth of your library. And FPCAM and RPCAM attempt to do that. They have a very simple formula, which is just take the total number of mappable reads for a particular feature, whether it's a gene or transcript, or indeed other features like exons. Um, we times it by a thousand and a million um, to get this per, th per K per M, and divide by um, this, the total number of mappable reads in the whole library and the length of the gene transcript feature, whatever you're looking at. And that's what gives you the kind of classic FPKM. You can do this calculation yourself, um, but most of the software like Cufflinks produce an FPKM-like measurement for you um, while also incorporating other more sophisticated normalizations. So they will incorporate things like uh, GC bias um, or other more sophisticated um, statistical concepts to further normalize that FPKM value. But it's based on this fundamental concept. So how does Cufflinks work? Um, Cufflinks is actually incredibly complicated in how it assigns um, read counts to different isoforms and then calculates FPKM-like <laughs> values from those uh, different isoforms. And the reason for that is that Cufflinks is trying to do something really fancy. It's trying to not only assign expression values to every transcript, but determine the identity of all of the transcripts in the sample at the same time, basically. And you can guide that based on known transcript structures, but it still is trying to be very clever and trying to say, based on the data, 
which transcript species do I believe are in this sample, and then assign reads in a probabilistic manner to those different uh, putative isoforms. And it does this first by um, assembling these uh, overlapping bundles of fragment alignments. So it'll say, okay, I see a pile of alignments here that look like they belong together. So I'm going to call those a, a bundle. Um, <clears throat> and that basically creates um, a possible locus. So there's this, this region of the genome that has all of these um, overlapping alignments which look like they could be um, evidence for expression from a gene locus. And then it tries to assemble those fragments into different transcript isoforms um, using um, concepts of, of graph theory. So it creates an overlap graph in which the different isoforms are inferred from the minimum paths required to cover the graph. So that's kind of depicted here. So you have all these um, fragments and there are a small number of fragments in there that are called mutually incompatible fragments. So they're fragments that give some um, kind of unique information where uh, two transcripts couldn't basically have two isoforms couldn't have both of these mutually incompatible fragments. So they indicate uh, putative differences where, for example, in one transcript an exon might be skipped and another transcript an exon might be retained, right? So those are, uh, a transcript can't have both a skipping and a retaining of an exon. And so if there are such differences in the data, you will see um, reads that span across um, junction for exon one to three, say, and then others that go from exon 1 to 2 and from 2 to 3, right? That right there indicates that there must be at least two different isoforms in this population. Uh, so it uses that information and attempts to assemble using a complicated probabilistic model what the most likely minimal set of paths through these, bun through these transcript fragments are until it comes up with a representation of, in this case it believes, based on these fragments that there are at least three uh, possible transcripts being expressed from this locus. A yellow transcript, a blue transcript, and a pink transcript. And then it goes back and looks at the reads and it assigns um, reads in a way to each of these fragments to estimate um, an expression level for each of them. It doesn't do like a simple direct one-to-one. -one. Um, basically there's going to be cases where, for example, in this part of this exon, there are many reads that are going to be equally supportive of any of the three isoforms, right? And this is the main problem with using short reads to estimate expression of transcripts, that there are, in mo most cases, almost all the alignments don't distinguish between the transcripts, and they could equally come from any of them. So it kind of uses the information of the mutually incompatible fragments to try and get a sense of proportionality and it comes, to what, comes up with the sort of most likely um, assignment of reads to each or proportion of reads to each isoform. And it uses information that it has like the fragment length distribution. So it has a sense of um, the, your, the, the typical size of your fragments. And based on that, it knows that a particular alignment may be more likely to uh, be evidence for one transcript versus another. Sorry, you had a question. When it does the step C of what you described as graph theory, yeah. does it go blindly by the results, or does it compare to what is known of particular genes? It's a good question, and the answer is um, both or either, depending on which mode that you run it in. So it has several different modes that you can run cufflinks in, um, and we're going to try running uh, basically th at least three of these different modes. Um, so there are some modes where you really give it a, a GTF, which has known transcript structures, and that really drives um, the assignment. Uh, but there are others where you can do like a pure de novo mode and tell it nothing about the known transcriptome, and it attempts to infer it from the data. So I've read this paper, I'm not a statistician, I've read this paper numerous times and tried to understand exactly the details of how um, this procedure works. It's very complicated. Um, 
it seems to work reasonably well. <laughs> I can say that. Um, I encourage you to, to also read the paper, and, and um, probably you can some of you can understand it better than I do. Um, but it's kind of like the the Bentley of expression estimation, right? They've like really thought hard about this and tried to make as sophisticated a model as possible. Mm -hmm. We're going to compare and contrast this to the complete opposite end, which is the simplest approach, which is like a count-based method. Um, you'll see for expression and differential expression purposes that there is a reasonably high concordance between them, but there are definitely significant differences. Um, and in our pipelines, we use both because the truth is probably somewhere in between or it's a third thing that hasn't been invented yet. Yeah. Yes. Yep. It just starts with the. So we're going to start directly from the top hat alignments that you generated yesterday. Uh, it doesn't have to be top hat. So recall that we had these optional um, aligner steps, and we've tried to set up the star alignments and the high sat two alignments in a way that is compatible with cufflinks. <clears throat> and indeed, the future supported um, aligner for cufflinks is HiSat2, which was developed by the same people as TopHat2. It's kind of like the updated aligner. Um, I was looking at the alignments from all three methods yesterday at a whole bunch of genes um, from the data that we're looking at. And there are definitely differences, but they're quite subtle. So the alignments are very, very similar. I think the main improvements for star and top um, star and high sat over top hat are performance based in terms of run time and so forth um, or other options but when run in the kind of cufflinks mode they high sat and top hat especially produce very very similar alignments so those should be uh, somewhat interchangeable so how does cuff diff work again just at a really high level what you're doing here is um, looking at the variability in fragment count um, for, e for each gene across replicates. Um, that's like any statistic, right? So however you come up with a, a measure of expression, um, there's going to be variability in that measure of expression between samples and a, you know, a statistic like a t-statistic would take into account the degree of variability between uh, a set of samples um, in condition A versus B and um, calculate a statistic uh, based on that variability. But there's also this concept of um, kind of confidence in um, the expression estimate. So the fragment count for each isoform is, is estimate and replicate as before, but there's also this measure of uncertainty in the estimate that has to do with the nature of the alignments. So if you're looking at um, two transcripts that have a lot of shared exons and very few of these um, unique features where there are uniquely assigned fragments, you're going to have more uncertainty. So I, I find it's easier to explain this if I draw it. Um, so the, the simple idea here is that imagine you have a really simple gene that has two transcripts. And let's say there's just like a really subtle difference, like this guy is just a little bit shorter than this guy. That's one situation. And then imagine another situation where you have some quite substantial differences. So this is gene A and this is gene B. Um, so let's say it skips a whole exon has like part of this exon and then another exon. Right, so you can see how in this situation you have, this is a gene with two transcripts that are very, very similar. And this is a gene with two transcripts that have quite a lot of differences, right? Now imagine you're aligning data to these two transcripts. In most cases, I'm just gonna use single end reads just for simplicity. You're gonna get reads like this, right? Stacking up on the exons 
and you're going to get reads that span <laughs> the introns that are junction supporting reads. And then there's going to be a few reads down here that are actually unique to this isoform that are not in this isoform. But other than that, all of the reads, when you look at them, you have no way to know whether this read is for this isoform or this isoform. The situation is very different below, right, where you're going to have reads that look like this, um, reads that look like this, um, let's see, reads that look like, oops, this, and so on. There's going to be lots of reads that are specific to this isoform or specific to this isoform because they have so many differences, right? So when cufflinks is trying to assign an expression estimate to each of these isoforms in gene A and gene B, it can have a lot more confidence or certainty in the value that it assigns to B1 versus B2 compared to the value it assigns to A1 or A2. Right here, it's going to more or less assign the same value to both, and maybe if it sees like something happening over here where, as I've depicted, there's like quite a bit more reads piling up. It's going to say, well, based on this very limited, unique space that I have to work with, I think the expression of isoform A is a little higher than, or A1 is a little higher than A2, but my certainty about that is much lower than my certainty about the expression differences or expression estimates uh, for B1 and B2. So this concept of certainty together with the variability, right, this is just within one sample. Now I have this sample and another sample and another sample where there's variability in the total amount of alignments to, to these different isoforms in each. Um, those two concepts, variability between samples and uncertainty of the individual uh, transcript or exon level estimates are incorporated into this statistical model for differential expression. So it somehow combines the estimates of uncertainty and the cross-replicate variability. It uses a beta negative binomial model um, to perform a statistic um, and basically comes up with a, a p-value and it has a built-in uh, multiple testing correction as well. So you'll get like a q-value um, and that will give you this concept of a differential expression statistic. And again, I believe there's a separate paper describing the whole cuff diff um, differential expression statistic. Or maybe it's in the cufflinx paper. Can I ask you a question yeah. about cuff diff? Sure. <laughs> so when I was running cuff diff, most of the time, the top, I was just looking up for transcript or isoform, just for gene, which is, I assume, it's much simpler than trying to identify isoforms. But the top of the list with the most differentially expressed or significantly differentially expressed genes was full of those that had very low expression levels in both really? samples. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them were zero and one and very low in the others. So mm -hmm. How do you get rid of those? How do you, can you filter them out somehow? Or how can you, you can definitely correct filter. Yeah, you can definitely filter them out. I'd say this is a common problem with count-based statistics. Yes, but it's ultimately based on digital counting, right? Like the underlying data is, it's not like, um, like a microarray where you have hybridization. It's like an analog measure, right? Um, so I think like if you look at like going back to the beginnings of like SAGE was the first like count-based gene expression sequencing method, we always had this problem where, yeah, the one versus zero ends up like looking significant. Um, I, you would really hope that the statistic would do a better job of dealing with that, like that that would be built into it, because there should be very high uncertainty for the expression estimates for something with so little alignments based on. Um, so it's disappointing that those are coming through as significant for you. But you can certainly easily filter them based on, and this is very common to have like minimal FPKM cutoffs for, um, so you can say that, for example, 
a common one is at least a certain percentage of samples in your data set must have at least a minimum FPKM value in order to trust the statistic. Do you but see where what do you set those? What, what, how do you set the where, value? Yeah, that, what's that work or when in the process That's of part of the what we talked about, the themes of these analysis workflows, that was the, the last step, which is like ad hoc summarization and interpretation. And we're going to actually go through some like R scripts where we kind of go through this kind of thing where we visualize and we say, okay, these things that are called significant, there's not really much of a full change. Let's apply a filter, or let's graph them so that we can see like what things, what genes are different that are actually highly expressed, what genes are called different that are both really lower expressed. Uh, you, you can ap apply that filter at multiple steps. I guess I would probably apply it at the end just because you run through the whole workflow and then you have the data. Yeah, the but problem with that is if you just get rid of those genes, you are left with a very small number. And when you did the statistics, I think the statistics actually you said the entire set. So you were taking into account those that you later discard. So I would rather get rid of them earlier. Yeah. Set yeah. I don't know how you practically do that. It's a good point because, like, I guess at least the multiple testing corrections and things like that are based on the, the complete result. Um, I don't know of an easy way that, like, in line you could remove those from the, the workflow and basically force CuffDiff to not consider them. Um, I guess if I was worried about that, I would probably switch to one of the other statistics that does allow you to more easily pre-filter before applying the statistic. Like where you're doing, for example, edge R, you're applying the statistic to the data, in a, to the almost the raw data, so you could easily filter out, you could do this exercise, find out genes that you think are questionable, and then not even bother applying a statistic to them. Yeah, it does. So maybe you can you might be able to change some parameters so that more genes get no tests. Exactly. I, sorry, I suspect that um, I think this uh, company uses a t-test, and it's really guaranteed that there's no tests Yeah, but you use a different set, like I was using the HTCB safety pair, but unfortunately you get an almost totally different set of genes <laughs> that were potentially expressed, so uh, it was hard to know exactly what is the correct way of doing it, but maybe yeah. the exercise will help clarify some issues. So, yeah, we do the same exercise and compare. Uh, Sounds like your overlap was worse than ours, so we did have a substantial overlap between the significant results of HTC count and edge R versus the cufflinks cuffdiff approach. Um, and arguably, maybe you trust the intersection more than things outside of it. Um, but if you see virtually no overlap, then it doesn't give you much faith in either approach, and that's that's cha challenging. Also, uh, um, possibly the number of replicates. Most of the time, given the high cost still of RNA-seq, we can't afford as many replicates. And if you have few or no replicates, the differential expression statistics, I would say, are almost worthless. I mean, you can do them, but you would probably be just as well served just looking at full changes or some crude metric because the statistics really break down without replicates. Suppose that you're not, you're not studying the program which constructs exist. In your A condition, how, how, how does it know that your reads, let's say, to exon 1 correspond to the, to the top 9 <coughs> to the bottom 9? 
So when you don't tell it about known transcript structure, it attempts to infer one. So it basically builds up its own GTF file. So it will define some transcripts. In the whole does it then differentiate that whatever binds to the first exon there on the left corresponds to the small one at the end or the large one at the end? It only knows it to this to the degree that it was based able to build a model. So you're you're asking about like how does it know that a read that aligns here belongs to a transcript that has this exact structure. I mean, it, it's tried to infer the structure by looking at um, the, the junctions, and but it, you know, it only has a certain confidence that that isoform actually exists. But it tries to determine what isoforms exist, and it creates a definition of isoforms, which may or may not be correct. It does its best job based on yeah, alignment spanning junctions and so forth. Not sure that I know, but what what you're asking? Between so between two isoforms of the same gene or between two genes? Between two isoforms of the same gene. Well, it so it tries, as I said, it tries its best based on um, content that is unique between the isoforms. So it's really the only thing it has to go on, right? So if there's uh, an exon junction, like a skipping or an extra piece of an exon that one isoform has and the other does not, that's really the only thing it can use to um, guess at the expression level of one isoform versus the other. For all of this, for all of this shared content, like these exons are exactly the same between these two isoforms, it really can't do anything with that information in terms of telling the expression level of one isoform versus another. It knows that there's expression here. At the gene level, it will just ignore the different isoforms and just group it together and say, this is all evidence of expression from this locus. But if it's if and when it tries to assign an expression level to this specific isoform over this specific isoform, it can only really do so based on differences between the isoforms. So if there are substantial differences like exon skipping events, it's not that bad because the reads that span across the junctions, some of those reads will be very unique. They could only represent isoform one other reads could only represent isoform 2. So we can use that information to give a good sense, like for all of the, the unique isoform 1 junctions, how much read support do I have? For all of the unique isoform 2 junctions, how much read support do I have? And you can use that to get a sense of whether one isoform is much more supported and highly expressed than the other. But if there are very few differences, um, it, it has a really hard time to tell. And the, that's why the uncertainty value would increase for that situation. And it, sh it will make it less easy to detect a significant differential expression difference um, for those isoforms, because there's greater uncertainty in them. So at the gene level, so if a particular gene has got three different isoforms, so it does it take a cumulative average of three isoforms and as the gene uh, Essentially, yeah. yeah. You, you said that the statistics uh, breaks down if you have only one replicate. Is that, yesterday you said that uh, technical replicates are very good, you get very good correlations, so you, you really don't have to do that many. But you need biological replicates. Oh, you're talking biological replicates. Yeah. 
So if you, I guess you, you won't gain that much from technical replicates because the technical replicates are so similar to each other that they're basically just giving you the same measurement again. That gives you confidence in the measurement you have for sample A from condition A. But when you're trying to show a significant difference between condition A and condition B, you need lots of samples from condition A and samples from condition B. Yeah. So unfortunately, we're still at the point with RNA-seq where it's, it's quite expensive. And I would say the vast majority of studies out there have not had enough replicates just for practical reasons. Oh yeah, you, yeah, you can still. You can get all of the above, basically. But yeah, when we run um, cufflinks, we will have gene level estimates of expression. We will have transcript level estimates, um, and possibly estimates at other individual feature levels. And sometimes those estimates will be good, and sometimes they won't be, depending on the complexity of, of the gene locus, really. What kind of outliers? Like sample outliers? Yes. Like does the sample not belong? To the group. Sorry? Does the sample it doesn't belong to the group as such? Yeah, I mean I think that all of the practices of expression analysis from twenty years ago from microarrays still apply. So you can certainly do an outlier analysis when you have um, all your in individual data sets, your expression estimates. I mean, we would do clustering analysis, we would do outlier analysis. If, yeah, if a sample looks very suspicious, is not clustering with the conditions you would expect, um, is an extreme outlier, then you may exclude that using the same logic you would for any data set before RNA-seq existed. Are you, so are you talking about transcripts that um, cufflinks inferred from the data, like yeah. potentially novel isoforms and yeah. so forth? Yeah, it's pretty easy to get. Um, so it, it builds a GTF file, which is, you know, we saw GTF files yesterday. They basically lay out the structure of genes and transcripts and features. And there are tools that you can use to um, extract, like, say, a FASTA sequence okay. based on a GTF file and a reference genome. Yeah. I don't know if it produces a FASTA file. I don't think it does just by default. Like I don't think it's a an existing output of the tool. You would have to run another tool, but it wouldn't be hard to get that. Okay. So we're also going to use a tool called um, Cuff Merge um, at one point during the workshop. And the reason for this is really tied up in what we've been discussing, which is Cufflink's ability um, to infer transcript structure. And what it allows you to do is merge different Cufflink's assemblies together. Uh, and this is necessary because um, even with replicates, Cufflink's won't always assemble the same number and structure of transcripts, right? So if you give it data, um, even from the same exact sample. Like let's say you took your sample and divided it into um, and sequenced it uh, to great depth and then provided it to, to top add and then cufflinks and it tries to infer all the transcripts. Even in that ideal situation it won't come up with exactly the same answer, right? So in this case like it might correctly identify this structure but then maybe the I don't know, the next sample, for whatever reason, because there's like a hole in the alignments or something, it comes up with a slightly different structure. You would have differences in the identity and the start and stop of exons between these inferred isoforms. And then how do you compare, right? So you've got two samples. 
and you're trying to compare the expression levels of transcripts, but you don't have the same transcripts. Um, so that's obviously a problem. It's like an apples to oranges problem. So cuff merge basically takes the GTF files that each cufflinks assembly has produced and create a consistent GTF file where it tries to um, use all the data at once um, to basically create a single representation of all the different isoforms um, that jives together. And this is even more important when you think about like different uh, samples that aren't replicates. So let's say we're doing a, a comparison between brain and liver. And there are some genes that are expressed in liver that just aren't expressed in brain, right? So for those transcripts, those liver-specific transcripts, in the liver sample, cufflinks will infer isoforms there. In the brain sample, it doesn't have any data because it's not expressed. So it can't possibly infer that those isoforms exist. So the GTF file it creates from the brain sample will simply not have certain isoforms represented that are represented in the other sample. But now we want to do differential expression analysis, and those are exactly the things we're looking for, right? The transcripts that are highly expressed in one tissue and not in the other. Maybe they're at zero in the other. So we need to create a, a common map that says these are all the total isoforms, and now I'm going to tally up the counts and expression estimates for this merged set of isoforms so that I can find exactly those cases where maybe I have really high expression in one sample or set of samples and no expression or very low expression in the other set. So, sorry, when you merge, they won't do it by condition. They right. actually combine all the liver and yes. the brain. Okay. Yeah, you'll give it like your entire data set mm -hmm. and do a merge across your whole data set irrespective of condition. Yeah. And then the last uh, major tuxedo tool that we're going to use is Cummerbund. Uh, this is an R package uh, which generates many of the commonly used uh, data visualizations, distribution plots, correlation plots, MA plots, volcano plots, clustering heat maps, uh, and even showing the individual gene and transcript level structures um, that have been uh, inferred by cufflinks. And these are just some of the samples. So these are a lot of just common visualizations that, that you would create in R or some other visualization package. Um, many of them are inspired from microarray analysis, uh, but uh, Cummerbund is supposed to provide you with a kind of um, easy, easily accessible or easy to use tool to get at these visualizations really quickly. So you can generate some of these visualizations with just one or two R commands, whereas if you were just given the output of cufflinks, you know, you might have to write a pretty lengthy R script to recreate some of these visualizations from scratch. So they're kind of convenience functions or helper functions um, to get to some of the commonly desired visualizations uh, more quickly. Unfortunately, I will say that I don't think Cummerbund is very well supported compared to the rest of the tools in the Tuxedo suite. Um, I think the postdoc whose project that was has moved on and has not really been maintained very well. So I feel like every year less of it works. Um, so we do have like an old school R scripts to generate most of the same um, visualizations. Of course, those are more complicated because we're doing exactly the thing that I was telling you Cumberbund is supposed to help you avoid. Um, but there we do provide both. So you'll kind of have uh, sample R scripts for how to create um, some of these visualizations uh, in sort of the old school way. Um, yeah. So there are alternatives to FPKM. The largest category of this would be raw read counts. Um, so instead of calculating an FPKM, you simply assign reads or fragments to a defined set of genes or transcripts and determine the raw counts for each gene or transcript. Uh, you could still um, do this first by using something like cufflinks or another transcript assembly program to generate like a GTF. So if you didn't want to use known genes or isoforms, you could try to infer genes and isoforms and then use that as an input to some of these count tools to assign counts to those. Uh, but typically, these are used for, for the case where you know what your genes and transcripts are, 
you're going to just trust Ensemble or RefSeq to have figured that out. And all you want to do is assign read counts to those known genes and transcripts, and then use some of the other available statistical packages um, to determine differentially expressed genes or transcripts. So we're going to go through how to use HTSeq count um, to do that. Uh, and then uh, we'll use a package, I believe we use EdgeR, to calculate differential expression between raw counts. So which should you use? FPCAM versus raw counts. Uh, they definitely have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, as I mentioned before, in our RNA-seq analysis pipelines, we just do both. Um, the FPKM style measurements are good when you want to leverage all the benefits and usability of the, the tuxedo suite. I prefer it for visualization. So if I'm trying to make a heat map and show kind of like global expression patterns and differences between sets of samples, I find FPKM is a very convenient starting point for that. Uh, raw counts, not so much. Um, calculating fold changes, um, things like that. I think where the counts are beneficial is when you want to use some of the more robust statistical methods, especially if you have appropriate replicates and maybe uh, if you have more complicated experimental designs like time series or if you're doing some kind of um, multivariate analysis, uh, there's a lot more options for the count-based statistical packages um, to accommodate those different designs. So, yeah, basically we, we do both, yeah. Didn't you say in the beginning that raw counts are in bias? So if you just purely use raw counts, it's problematic. Um, these statistical packages aren't just doing a t-test between the raw counts. They're taking into account ideas like the library depth and so on. Um, and they will argue that they've they've thought through like the statistical problems of uh, this count-based data more carefully or in a better way than the FPCAM statistic so it's or the cufflinks. Yeah. Raw yeah. Raw counts by themselves are not very useful, but together with the packages like EdgeR or um, DEseq or other ones, um, you can get good statistical measures of differential expression where they're doing the appropriate normalizations and um, applying the right assumptions. Okay, alternative differential expression methods. These are, we're going to try EdgeR. Um, these are just a couple examples of those that, those R packages that use raw count approaches. Um, As I said, we advise multiple approaches, and the reason for that is, is really expressed in this um, Venn diagram where you can see um, there is a substantial overlap between the approaches, but there's also a huge amount of non-overlap. And I don't think it's clear yet which of these answers is correct. Probably none of them are quite correct. Um, so applying multiple approaches. I think it gives you a little more confidence in things that are consistently identified between the approaches. Uh, it also gives you a more comprehensive result if you're worried about missing something. Um, but as with anything, um, you're going to want to think about validation experiments and so on um, for any of the predictions that come, especially from only one method. So lessons learned from microarray days. I think in the early days of RNA-seq, people really did kind of um, forget some of these lessons. Uh, RNA-seq is very exciting. It's extremely powerful to detect new kinds of events. Um, but when you're talking about differential expression analysis and clustering and so on, really most of the issues that we've learned the hard way in microarray expression days are still valid and apply. Um, so things like power analysis, there's a tool um, from the Marth lab you can use to try to determine how many replicates you need to be sufficiently powered to detect um, significant events under certain conditions. Uh, most people will not like the answers they get from that, but uh, there's not much we can do about that. Um, there's definitely a need for biological replicates. Um, the, as I said before, the tools just really break down um, when you don't have replicates. 
Um, and then there's quite a few um, discussions about RNA-seq study design that you can find on, on BioStars. Yeah. Scoffling is set up for, for a stratified experimental design. Are there tools that allow you to analyze if you have an epidemiological design with continuous variables? Um, yes, I think I would. I don't know which package will be best, but I suspect that one of these count-based packages that I mentioned would have a lot more options in terms of your study design. So you're talking about trying to determine uh, like uh, correlation or regression statistics between a continuous variable and expression. Yeah, I mean you can certainly do this with the output of cufflinks as well, but you just probably would not run cuffdiff. You would import that into R and then start applying many of the existing R packages for, for those kind of statistics. But the count-based packages I bet have those abilities built into them. Uh, multiple testing correction is more important than ever. Um, so the main reason for that is that as you compare more attributes, it's more likely um, that treatment and control groups will appear different for at least some attributes by random chance. And when I say attributes, I mean genes, transcripts, exons, and so on. Um, so when we had microarrays, we had something like 20 to 50,000 genes or transcripts being measured. Um, with RNA-seq, we have all the complexity of the transcriptome. We have potentially uh, custom-defined isoforms, maybe 100,000 isoforms. Uh, we have all the individual features can now be assayed um, very discreetly. Um, which you know could go to the individual exon or junction, junction or intron level, um, microRNAs, link RNAs, etc. So we, we're doing more tests than ever, which means our multiple testing problem is bigger than ever. Um, we usually use the bioconductor malt test package. Um, there is multiple testing built into many of the, the, the software as well, like, like CuffDiff. And then of course, RNA-seq doesn't solve any of the downstream problems, um, which would be really a topic for a whole other course. Um, you can feed the results of your expression and differential expression analysis into many existing analysis pipelines, pathway analysis, um, that sort of thing. Um, we do provide a supplementary R tutorial on some basic clustering and heat maps, um, both by Cummerbund and, and custom R scripts. Um, if you want to do classification analysis, I think RNAC can be really powerful for that. Um, I did a study of breast cancer looking for um, classification models that could distinguish between drug responders and non-responders, and I had very um, comprehensive genomic profiling of these samples. So I had microarray data, I had um, exon uh, sequencing mutation data, copy number data, um, a, a bunch of others, and I found that RNA-seq was actually the most powerful data type for distinguishing between the samples. Again, just because it has such rich information, so many features to distinguish between samples. Um, there's packages like Weka are a good learning tool for classification. I usually use random forests in R when I'm doing classification analysis. Uh, and yeah, again, pathway analysis, there are many existing um, tools and packages, um, and you can read about those in BioStars. Uh, but unfortunately, we're probably not going to get far enough um, in the time allotted to focus on those. So in Module 3, going back to the practical exercises, we might just rewind slightly because I think there was maybe one exercise we didn't finish yesterday, and I don't know if you guys want to finish that. We can kind of go back and finish it. Uh, but then we'll continue with um, the module that basically picks up where you guys have left off. So what we've done so far, we've obtained our raw sequence data, um, we've produced alignments for that data against our reference genome that we also obtained. Uh, we obtained annotations and we used those, uh, or we're going to use those annotations together with our alignments to compile transcripts and estimate expression for those transcripts and genes. Uh, we'll then merge together 
those um, transcript representations from the different samples to create a consistent uh, view of the, the transcriptome, uh, which will allow us to do this cuff-diff comparison between our two conditions, uh, and then ultimately visualizations uh, based on those. Standard, standard library. Uh huh. And I thought the data coming, uh, the data we were working on chromosome 20 came from a standard library. It does. But is there any specific step where we have to define the standard file or something like that? So the question is um, the data that we got uh, is is it stranded or not? And yes, it is. And is there any. Um, like setting or file where we have to specify that it's stranded? And the answer is yes. So there were options in Top Hat. And I think there is an option in Cufflinks as well where we specify strandedness. Um, but for sure in Top Hat. So that's something you have to know about your data. Although when you align data, um, you can often figure it out and kind of reverse engineer it because stranded data has a very distinct alignment um, pattern compared to unstranded data. Um, and I think, I don't know if you did this exercise, but when you're in IGV, if you color the reads by uh, first strand pair, I think the option is called, you can see very clearly which strand the alignment is coming from for each transcript. And in stranded data, you'll see all of the alignments on one strand for, one, for each gene and it'll switch between strand depending on which strand the gene is transcribed from. But yeah, there are, um, there's not a file, but there are just um, options that you choose uh, when you run the tools to specify the stranded nature of your, of your data. And there's a whole table on the wiki that explains what those settings are for the different tools that we use in the workshop. It's, I think, supplementary table two.